Well, hello and welcome to the May 16, 2021 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. I'm Pastor Michael J. Matisic. Christian Fellowship Church is located in Northwest Indiana. We are at 605 165th Street in Hammond, and we are just outside of the south side of Chicago. We are on the Indiana-Illinois border, and if you're looking for a church, a Bible church, a church that teaches the Word of God, we would sure love for you to come and join us. Perhaps you're outside of the area, you want more information, or you may want more information about our church, we are at cfc-church.net on the World Wide Web, and you can get the physical address as well as the internet address at the end of this video in the last frames as well, so you can stop the video and write that down. Well, we are in the middle of May, May 16th, and last Sunday was Mother's Day. Boy, did we have a wonderful Mother's Day breakfast for our women, and we used to call it our pancake breakfast. We still serve pancakes, but we have more than that. We have the eggs, and we have the fruit, and we have the bananas, uh, fruit, and, then, and then, we have, uh, then we have these wonderful muffins. So what a wonderful breakfast we had for our church. And if you missed it, make sure you're here next year. But in the meantime, know there's a lot of activity going on at the church. We're going to be recognizing high school seniors. We're going to have our communion, and then we're going to have um, a baptism in the month of June as well. So we'd love to have you come and be a part of all that we're doing at Christian Fellowship Church. At this time, we're going to transition to our music team, our, our songs from last Sunday, which would have been Mother's Day. And then we're going to be transitioning back to me, and we're going to be looking at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So have a Bible ready and get ready to study the Word of God when we come back. All right. Happy Mother's Day.
Please open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50 is where we're going to start. We're coming back to a section of scripture that we started studying two weeks ago before Mother's Day, verses 50 to 57. But for those of you who've been with us, you know that we've been in a larger section of scripture, verses 20 to 58, for several months now. And the theme of this 
section of scripture deals with the fact that, yes, there will be a resurrection for believers. So if you have those sermon notes, then you see the theme is, yes, there is a resurrection for believers. And so the section that we're studying is going to deal with the rapture and how it's a possibility for believers to get their resurrection body without even dying. So we're going to get into that. And so last time we studied this text, I told you that this has one of the best blessings in all the scripture next to actually getting into heaven. Um, it's one of the nicest blessings. And that is that you don't ever have to die if this passage gets applied to you while you are alive. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But it is a text of scripture that we're coming to that I'm really excited to be studying. Um, many, many reasons. I think that anytime you open up the Bible, we should be excited. And I've been emphasizing this more and more to our church body because I want us to always have the understanding when we open up the Bible, it's not like an ordinary book. It's not like any novel. It's not like any self-help book or any other instruction manual. It is the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord is repeated throughout the Bible. And it is a text of Scripture that is truly, truly holy. It is a book set apart. And any other religious book, the Book of Mormon or any uh, Hindu book or any other religious book that out there doesn't compare, even the Quran, because those books are not the Word of God. And the Bible is clearly the Word of God. And so when we come as believers in Jesus Christ, recognizing the uniqueness of this book, yes, we should always be excited to open it up and to see what we're going to learn from God. And then second, as we come to this text, I think there's the reality as we come to this text that it is a book that you're always learning in. And I think there were a couple things that I was like, wow, that's really interesting this week. And I hope to share them with you and point that out to you. This is a text of scripture that I think is very, very practical. It was interesting that I talked to... Um, Larry Overstreet, Dr. Larry Overstreet this week. He was teaching at the IFCA Northern Regional in Indiana on Monday, the week that I had this recorded, and he was speaking ironically on the practical nature of prophecy. Uh, Dr. Overstreet is a former professor at Grace College and Seminary. Uh, he's now retired. He's author of several books, and he's 80 years old. And when he was talking about this very passage that we're looking at, he talked about it in an exciting way, talking about how he feels so blessed to um, know this truth that perhaps he may never have to die. And we want you to always be thinking that. I want you to always be aware of what a blessing that would be if you were to have to, um, if you got to be raptured and you didn't have to go through physical death. Uh, physical death is something that is painful. Um, and that's why last time we studied this, I said a lot of people uh, pray that they could die in their sleep. Uh, and if this passage were to come and be true to you, then think about it. No pain, no suffering, no harm ever coming to you. Um, no more aging, no more illness, no more dealing with bad things. Because in a moment, in a second, as this text will teach, you could have your new resurrected body. And boy, wouldn't that be exciting. And so, yeah, this is a wonderful text, and you have not only your resurrection body back, but this text basically reunites us with Jesus and the fact that it'll be face-to-face -face with Jesus. So you remember, there's a great blessing that the Apostle Paul says there's a crown for those who love the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so my challenge to you is, do you love that? Is that something that you look forward to? And over everything else that's going on in life, yeah, I know that you can look forward to graduation or a new job or, uh, you know, some significant event in your life, some sporting event you want to watch. But the reality of it is, is the number one drive in all of our lives should be the return of Jesus Christ. And if it would happen today because of the application of this passage, we wouldn't have to die, which makes it all the more uh, a blessing. And so I know that the world doesn't want to talk about death. They hate death. There's a famous celebrity that uses this joke. He tells it all the time, and he says, um, I don't mind death. I just don't want to 
be there when it occurs or when it comes and visits, however he puts it. But, you know, the reality of it is, is um, everyone is going to face death. And so I know the world tries to joke about death. Here's a, here's a little joke. I, another joke I found about death. It says this. Um, what did the calendar say to, um, to his friends on his deathbed? And he said, my days are numbered. Ha, 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 ha. Well, <laughs> I told that joke because in the Bible, God tells us in the book of Psalms to number our days and to always think about death. The world is not thinking about death. You talk to most people, they, they, they don't want to push it off as if they're not going to die. But God wants believers to be thinking about death. It's the opposite for the Christian. And so, yeah, I'm excited about getting into this text, and I'm excited about the things that we're going to learn. And, and as we get into this text, I hope it is a, uh incredible blessing to you because you're always going to be learning from God. You can never exhaust his resources as if you could go up to the ocean with a pail and start taking water out, and you think you're going to exhaust the ocean. You can't do that. And there's no way that you can ever exhaust all the knowledge that's in the Word of God because God is this infinite being. He's incredible in his knowledge. So every time I come into the Bible, I learn a lot. So let's pick up um, and read the text of Scripture that where we're at. Verse 50 says this, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit the imperishable. Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Verse 53, For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will put on the imperishable, and this mortal will put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So where are we at in the book of 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians is written about 55 AD. Paul is answering all these questions and all these problems. Um, he's trying to deal with them throughout the book. He recognizes that the church doesn't think that there is a resurrection of the dead. How do we know that? It should be drilled into those of you who have been following this text um, already. Verse 12, Paul basically says at the end of verse 12, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And then from verse 13 to 19, he gives some rhetorical answers. And then from verse 20 to 58, he begins to lay out five major reasons why there is a resurrection of the dead. And if you have your sermon notes, you see that I've listed those out and that you can see that each one of them is a large section of Scripture. Like the very first one, the order of the resurrections guarantees it. And you go from verses 20 to 28, as Paul talked about the first fruits and the order of the kingdom. All of that was the drive to come to this main point. Yeah, there is a resurrection of believers. And then we talked about the testimonies who validate it in verses 29 to 34. And then we went through the details of the glorified body in verses 39 to 35 to 49, where there was no exhortation that Paul just wanted you to understand. And if you understood that there is a resurrection body for you and how it's all going to work as he worked through those three different analogies, then you would be able to say, yeah, I should live for God. Because remember, the entire purpose is to give you the information so that you don't live for the world. And that was the problem. We know based upon the passages where Paul begins to explain the testimonies that there was a good number of these people who were partying up and living sexually immoral and drinking and getting drunk. And Paul says, no, basically I want you to have a right focus. I want you to live holy and I want you to serve God. And so the people who have an understanding that there is a resurrection of body, of a, a resurrection body coming for them will do that. For people who don't think there's a resurrection, they say, well, this is all there is, which is mind-blowing because you would wonder, well, what do they think they're believing in in Jesus? But yet I, I deal with some of the cults today, and I see that they teach the same thing. They twist the scriptures. So our context is, is that Paul has been working through five big reasons. We've studied the third 
the first three in great detail. This is the fourth one. And if you look on your notes, it says the rapture is a possibility as well, where the Apostle Paul was trying to get believers to understand they're going to get a resurrection body without dying, which is the blessing, the nice promise. And then we get to go right into the kingdom um, of God. Now, as we come to this text, um, I said two weeks ago, as we come into this study, that this is a study that is entering like in the fast lane. If you're on the freeway, you can be in the slow lanes on the far right, the lanes that go the speed limit, or you can jump into the far left lanes that, you know, they, those people speed and they go intense. And when they go intense, you got to be staying alert. And the reason I'm saying this for this text is that this text brings in a lot of theology. This brings in more theology than the average text. Um, and, and so the three major issues I said that we need to keep before us is number one, we got to keep remembering what the entire purpose of this chapter is about. And I've emphasized it enough is that Paul wants us to understand there is a resurrection of the, of, of the believer's body. And so when we understand it, that we live holy. So yes, there is a resurrection uh, for believers. And, and I could sound like a broken record. I know, just going over and over. But that is, in the fast lane, we've got to keep that focus because things could distract us. And the other things that can distract us are these theological understandings we had to bring into this. And I said there were two. There was dealing with the kingdom, and then there is dealing with the rapture, which we're going to focus on today. Two weeks ago when we studied this passage, I began talking about this issue of the kingdom. So number one, we want to stay on the main focus of this text, but then two, we need to understand the kingdom. And when the Apostle Paul says in verse 50, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You have to understand the kingdom is a very specific um, government that God is bringing to the world. And so if you um, need to study that, I would encourage you to go back to um, our podcast or go back to our YouTube video from two weeks ago. Um, so it would be the May 2nd study and begin to scratch the surface because the kingdom is one of the most detailed subject matters in all of scripture. But I just want to summarize it for our understanding here through three main points. I'm going to show a slide on Sunday for this. And the, the slide is going to show that the kingdom of God is a literal future event. We study this. It is not a kingdom now. People who think that are misunderstood. Kingdom of God will be have believers in different bodies. And so that's for the first phase, the 1,000 year reign of Revelation 20, where the church and Old Testament saints that have been resurrected will be in their glorified bodies. But we're also going to have Jews and Gentiles from the tribulation in non-glorified bodies. And that comes from the Isaiah 65 passage. And so if you're interested in this, study it, look it up. But it's critical that you understand that and have that understanding as we come to this text Otherwise, you're going to be greatly confused. And then third, we talked about the fact that the kingdom of God is worth everything. And my exhortation to you is to make sure you're a believer in Jesus Christ. As we looked at the, the um, parables in Matthew 13 and verse 44 and 45, about it's like the treasure in the field, the pearl of great price. It's worth everything. You need to make sure that you get into the kingdom. And so the kingdom is, is a very important subject in Scripture, and you need to have a right understanding when we study this text. And then third, we need to understand the rapture. And the rapture is, I believe, the event that verses 51 and 53 are really talking about. And the rapture is an event where Christ meets his church in the air. It's described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, it is also, I believe, alluded to in John 14. And it is the belief that Christ is coming back for his church and meets them in the air and takes them back to heaven during the time of the tribulation. Now, in the past, I've done a great in-depth study on the rapture. Um, I would encourage you to look that up on our podcast. Uh, there are five studies that we've done. And if there's five studies, there's a lot of information on it. So I'm trying to keep it real simple here because I want to stay dealing with that first issue, staying focused on the text. But I also need to have you understand that there is this coming event 
that I believe is before the tribulation. It's at any moment of that, which we call the pre-trib rapture. Now, there are a lot of different views on when the timing of the rapture occurs, pre-trib, mid-trib, pre-rap, end of the tribulation, um, end of the millennium. The idea I get is that there is a lot of question regarding the timing. There is no question regarding if it occurs. This passage here describes it. 1 Thessalonians 4 describes it, the seizing, the rapture of the believers from the earth. But I believe theologically, and that's why I would encourage you to look at those um, podcasts, because I truly believe the rapture occurs before the tribulation. But when we start to think about the rapture, it could really bring us more into the fast lane. We, we start to lose the focus on what this text is all about. And so hopefully I'll be able to touch upon the rapture, but also keep coming back to the main purpose of this text. So with that understanding, look at verse 50, just a quick recap when he says, Now I say this, brother, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. That what the Apostle Paul was doing was, was telling us that the resurrection body is necessary for the church, for believers. For believers in the church, I can't emphasize that enough, in the church, because there are going to be non-believers that go, I mean, there are going to be believers that are not going to have glorified bodies, which will have children that will end up with not being non-believers that will be in the kingdom that will end up dying. So if you don't understand that, then this passage is going to be really confusing, and all of a sudden you're going to start thinking the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation. I mean, yeah, at the end of the tribulation, which, you know, or at the end of the millennium, even. It just doesn't make sense. So, he's speaking about the church in verse 50, and now in verse 51 is when he brings up the rapture. And if you have your sermon notes, you see that I put some eight rapture facts. The rapture is, okay? The rapture is, and if you have your, the sermon notes, we're going to have a fill in the blank. And so, let me begin, and he says in verse 51, Behold! Now, behold, is like, see, look, this is like to catch your attention. And I'm hoping that it has. So verse 51, he says, I tell you a mystery. I tell you something that was once unknown. Now, a mystery is like a secret. Um, it's something that you hide from people. And to be honest, God hid this fact, this fact about this transformation, this rapture event, in the Bible, you can't go and read about it in the Old Testament, nor can you really see it in the Gospels as well. Because if Jesus was accepted, you wouldn't have a rapture, you wouldn't have the church. But the idea is that you have this mystery. And I think a lot of people get confused with a lot of Bible commentaries that try to describe a mystery as something that was once unknown. No, a mystery is it's like a secret. And if I've got a secret and I tell my wife that secret, it's still a secret. Right? Because it's, it's something that we try to um, keep away from people. And the idea of a mystery, like it's a mystery book. I read it when I'm all done. I still call it a mystery book because it dealt with something that was, one, that, that was dealing with an unknown. And now that unknown's been discovered. But um, if I said it's a mystery, but I'm not telling you, it's still a mystery, right? So the idea is, is that when we understand that this concept is driving this passage, then I think it helps us to understand, I'm not going to be able to go to the Old Testament and find the rapture anywhere. I'm not going to go into the Gospels and really find the Gospel teaching about the rapture. The only illusion in all of the Gospels is that John 14 passage. And, and it's more that, oh, this is when this must occur. So understand, the rapture is a mystery. And so he says, we will not all sleep. So there's the idea that we're not going to die. Sleep is a euphemism for, for death. And like I said, some nicest promise in Scripture. That you, one of the nicest, one of the nicest. Obviously, going to heaven, being rewarded for how we live. Those are all great blessings. But listen, not dying is a wonderful blessing. So he says, we will not all sleep, but we will all be transformed. And the word for transform there is a Greek word that's in the pa passive tense, and it deals with a a transformation that occurs. It's the future passive of a word that means that we're going to be to be turned into something different and it's in the future and it's passive and for those of you who love your English uh, 
they say that tongue in cheek. When you deal with the passive, it means that someone's doing it to you. Someone else or some other force. We will be changed. We're not going to transform ourselves. We know theologically that God is the one that's going to transform us. So if you have your sermon notes in front of you and you look at the first three facts, just drop jot these down. So you, we, the rapture was once a secret. That's the first one. It was once unknown, but now it's known. Two, it, it deals with the fact that some believers never die, but just get their body. Okay? Some believers never die, but just get their new body. And then third, it is when all, A-L-L, -L, alive and dead Christians get their new body. And, and the reason it, um, I want to dif differentiate between two and three is that th the reality is that I want to make it clear that, that believers will go through this transformation process who are alive and get their new body. But when we are alive and we get our new body, it's at the same time that the dead people get. That's the third point. The dead believers are going to get their bodies at the same time. And basically what Paul is working at is that this ends death for everybody in the church. Everybody in the church. Everybody in the church. Because we know that after this event, there is still some death to occur. But this is what I really found as something that hit me like a new. Where what I'm realizing is that everybody in the church live and dead now get their new body so that is what he's trying to say when he uses that word all in verse 51 you can circle it all all we will all be changed there there's no discrimination every believer gets their new body whether they're dead or whether they're alive so then we pick up in verse 52 and it says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet so here deals with some of the timing in a moment uh, the word moment there deals with an atom of time, something that can't be split. So basically what he's trying to do is trying to really emphasize, it's fast. It's like, boom, you know, and, and the twink, you know, the eye, twinkling of an eye is a, an eye blink, boom. You know, you, you can blink your eye and it never um, obscures your vision. You, you, you blink and all of a sudden, you know, your eyes move, but you don't stop um, seeing. You don't go into darkness, boom. It's, it's, it's that fast. So here's the timing. The, the, the first the, um, thing we're seeing is that it happens fast. That's point four. And it happens fast. And, 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 and what's the significance of that? Well, the significance of this is that God is trying to get us to understand here, you want to make theology practical, is that you don't have time to prepare for it. You, you better be living prepared for it. This is why I challenge you to holy lives and serving, because you need to be ready for it. But then he goes on to say, it's at the last trumpet. And the idea of a trumpet is like a blaring, it's a signal, you know, like, you know, like when they attacked Jericho, they went with trumpets and they, you know, they announced that, you know, they're going to attack and, and um, um, Joshua had the people blow the trumpets. Well, we see trumpets in the book of Revelation too. And yet the trumpet judgments are in the middle of the series of judgments. You have the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. The trumpets aren't the end and they don't bring the end of the tribulation. So, is this the seventh trumpet of the tribulation judgments? I, I don't think so. Theologically, this is where, you know, if you go into those theological, um, those podcasts on the, on, the, on, the, on the timing of the rapture, I go into great, greater detail. I just think this is the last trumpet for the church. Excuse me, the last trumpet for the church. Because I think we're just talking about the, the church as, as the entity that God is speaking of at this time. And he says in verse 52, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will, we will be changed. And so here we get into the idea that this ends the period for the church. So verse, um, or fact number five, it happens as the last event, L-A-S-T, the last event. Um, the word last there is the Greek word eschata, and which we get eschatology, last, study of last things. This is, I believe, the last event for the church. And if you had a wrong view of the kingdom, you had a wrong view of, of, of where the, the thousand year reign is, then yeah, you're gonna be messed up. But to me, this is the last event for the church. And there will be a trumpet. I, I, I believe the angels are gonna sound it. And it's going to be uh, something maybe we'll even hear. 
but the idea of the imperishable is where he's coming back to this reality of the fact that it will never rot and everyone is going to go through the transformation so he's like emphasizing the transformation the second time he's brought that up we're going to be changed we're going to be changed and what he's trying to keep us on the main road is that there are some people that are going to get their resurrection body without ever dying and so when we see this and he says in, at the end of verse 52 the dead will be raised fill in point number six dead christians will be participate and i'm just emphasizing this again because he's emphasizing again so i think point three is the joint aspect and verse three is just again emphasizing that the dead in Christ will rise first, okay? And so I think when you see this, and he says the dead will be raised imperishable, we're talking about all believers in the church. Um, there's coming a resurrection for Old Testament saints and, and people who die in the tribulation that were believers, but this is, I believe at this time, the resurrection for the church. And so... Um, number seven, um, what we're going to get to is that we're going to get an, an imperishable and immortal body for believers. Fill in that blank because we see in verse 53, for this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. This is what Paul described the body as up in verse 42 when he said in verse 42, so this resurrection of the dead is sown a uh, perishable body is raised in imperishable. It's, it's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. Um, the idea is, is that we uh, are never going to rot. And immortality is that it, 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 it's eternal. And so we want to recognize that this body that we're getting is very unique. And so what this does as we come to the end of verse 53 is that it ends death it ends death for the church and that's basically where 54 to 57 is sort of like going to describe how that death is going to um, be ended here it ends death for the church and so where verse 54 says but when this imperishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality then will come about the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory and and so when this occurs, so this is the timing, the word when, and he's making it specific. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to what I just talked about in verse 53. Make it clear here that we're talking about the end of death. And this is a quote from Isaiah chapter 25. And if you read Isaiah 25, it's a very clear quote. It's you know talking about description of what the Messiah is going to do. Death is going to be swallowed up as if uh, you know like um, a person could swallow it and then you, you just take it away, it get, then it gets digested and gets eliminated. It, it, that, it's the idea uh, maybe of the earth swallowing it up, okay? It's the idea that it will no longer be something that we have to deal with. And so it's a pretty straightforward quote. What is not a straightforward quote is the next one because he quotes Hosea chapter 13, verse 14, and this is a verse that is often read at scripture, I mean, at, at funerals, when he says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? He's sort of chiding death here. Okay, we're coming back to the point that this death is going to be ending for the church. And he says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And, and I'm not going to have you turn there, but I just want you to know that if you were to go back and read the book of Hosea, Hosea is bringing a judgment before the Assyrian um, attack on northern Israel. And, and that's going to occur in 722 BC. So Hosea's writing them and he's telling them, you need to understand judgment is coming. And in chapter 13, he's chiding northern Israel. Um, and I say northern Israel because um, as we have Israel divided, Israel and Judah, sometimes um, we just call the northern tribes, the ten tribes, Israel. And ironically, in Hosea chapter 13, he calls them Ephraim because they were the largest tribe. Um, and, and he's basically saying in Hosea, hey, where is your victory? Um, where is your sting to tell death, come on, you need to come and judge these people. Uh, and so I would tell you to go back and you look at it because he ends the, the section saying, you know, there's not going to be any compassion. I'm not going to care for anybody. 
Well, the Apostle Paul takes that and now twists it and turns it around and uses it in a way that is chiding death. Instead of like telling death to come on, he's like saying, ha ha death, you, you know, you've had your time, you've done your thing, but it's all over now. So where is your victory? Your Nike, your, your winning, everything that you ever thought you were gonna get accomplished, you're not. And oh death, where is your sting? You know, when we talk about death bringing pain and hurt, separation from people we love, the, the sting as if you, a bee had a stinger. And, it, it, you know, where is it? Because, um, as the Apostle Paul says, the sting of death is sin. And we know sin brings pain, brings consequences that we do, brings separation from people because it eventually ends up in death. And, and the power of sin is the law. And I believe that's the Old Testament law there. And it's not that we're under the law or that we should invoke the law. I think Paul just talks about how, as he does in the book of Romans and chapter 7 and other places in Romans, about how God was, has used the law and how in, like in the book of Galatians, the law is powerful but, and, and man couldn't ever be perfect to keep the law. But the idea is that the law exposes us and shows us for our sin. And so as he, he talks about that power that it holds over mankind, then it brings a, a control. Now, some people, I just got to point, think that this is, could just be the moral law of God. And that's a possibility, but I just think in the context, the Apostle Paul, using so many Old Testament quotes, would be talking about the Mosaic law here. And so, look, we all understand, because the ways of sin is death, and none of us can stop sinning, because we know God's rules, and we, you know our flesh is corrupt, it brings pain, and, and, and it brings this thing of death. But what Paul was trying to do is saying, it's all done now. That's why verse 57, but thanks be to God. This is a worship. I'm praising God. And I believe that God there is God the Father and, and who gives us the victory, all right? Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus is the one who paid the penalty for our sin. Jesus is the one that needs to be worshiped here. And I just want to make, I got this in my notes. Um, the idea of the word through is the idea of agency. He's the one that accomplished it. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for sin. And Jesus Christ is the one who accomplished the victory. The wage of sin is death. We cannot pay the penalty for sin. And if you're recognizing that you've sinned, which you all should, you recognize you can't fix it with money or church attendance. And that's one of the sad things, the sad realities of, um, uh, of so many false religions. They, they tell people that if you give so much money, you do so many good works that you can wipe away sin and the penalty for sin. But that's not true. The wages of sin is death. God wants your life. And if you give your life, then you have nothing. So sin um, can take away your life. And we understand that death that occurs is a physical death and a spiritual death because the Bible talks about a physical death. But then there is the second death, a spiritual death, where people are thrown into the lake of fire. And so my hope and my understanding is that um, everyone needs Jesus Christ. My hope is in Jesus, and my understanding is that he's the only solution. And that's what Paul is thanking God for. And so, you know, this is, this is a truism that is true for us, and then ultimately for all who have believed in God, according to Romans 3, throughout the ages. That, you know, people who died, Old Testament saints, it was because of Christ, even though they didn't put their actual um, the faith in naming Jesus, they were believing God and believing his promises of a coming Messiah. So now that it's been realized, we can say, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, he's God um, in charge. Lord, he is Jesus. He was a human being with this specific name. Christ, he is the Messiah. And you see that pronoun there? Our Lord. There's an identification. We have a relationship with him. And this is where we talk about Christianity being a religion, a faith of a relationship. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So all of this is from verses 54 to 57 is dealing with how death is ended for the church and will ultimately be fulfilled throughout all eternity. I, I get that. Um, you could say, well, isn't this the end of death? Well, I think he's pointing to the fact that this is where we're all, we're all going, but we recognize because we've done our theology on the kingdom that there's going to be um, different phases. 
and, and I can't just em I can't help but keep emphasizing that over and over. But for us who are believers, death is done for us. And I wanted to read you this quote from R. H. Lenski. I quoted him before, a great commentator. Um, he said, "Death is not merely destroyed when we look at this text." Death is not merely destroyed so that it cannot do further harm while all of the harm which it has wrought in God's children remains. And what he basically was saying is that this isn't just like a, a partial fix. This is a complete fix. And he goes on to illustrate it and he says, The tornado is not merely checked so that no additional homes are wrecked while those that were wrecked still lie in ruin. Death and all its apparent victories are undone for God's children. What looks like a victory for death and like a death defeat for us when our bodies die and decay shall be utterly reversed so that death dies in absolute defeat and our bodies live again in absolute victory. Now again, that word victory comes from the Greek word Nike and we have a, an apparel company, a shoe company that calls themselves Nike, victory. And I want to use the world's advertisements, the world's product. Every time you see that, maybe have it reinforced that there is victory for you as a believer in Jesus Christ. And, and, and it's important to have that mindset because as we talk about death, death is no joke. And people can joke about it all they want, but the reality of it is, is death is coming for everyone except for the people who are alive when this passage gets applied and how we all want this. How Dr. Overstreet wants it, I wanted it. Pastor Curry, who used to pastor our church, you know, basically told me he wanted it, he looked forward to it. And I, I wonder how many of you look for it as well. Um, that you could be changed, as you see in verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. But what is the main focus of this? Just the rapture? Just the kingdom? No. It's that you get a resurrection body now. And if you got that resurrection body now, live faithfully for God. Don't get involved in sin. <laughs> It's so easy to get focused on the kingdom or the rapture, but the reality here is holy living, serving God, because you get a resurrection body. And so this should impact the way a husband treats a wife, the way a wife treats her husband, uh, the way children obey their parents, the way we live holy. We don't get involved in, in drugs and drinking, in sexual immorality. We, we live holy, but it's not just the things that we don't do. It's the things that we positively do. We serve God. We get involved in witnessing. We give. And so I want us to be people who recognize that this rapture has a very practical application and, and, and that it's to change our lives today because you can't prepare for it. It happens in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And boy, what a wonderful event it would be to hear that trumpet, to be changed in that, that moment, that split second, and to face Jesus. It could happen today. It could happen at any moment. And so make sure you're ready to get this special body and to face Jesus. The only way you can be is if you believe upon the gospel. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you're born again. I've been trying to keep the gospel real simple by using that illustration, the ABCs of the gospel. A, admit you're a sinner. Recognize the things you think to say and do fall short of the glory of God, as well as your omissions. You're supposed to do a lot of things, and you don't do them. A lot of people say, oh, I don't do anything bad. We don't do anything good either. So sins of omission are a sin as well. And the wages of sin is for one sin sends you to eternal damnation. You can't fix it. You can't give money. You can't light a candle. You can't attend the church. The only way to fix it is to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The B. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Specifically, you have to understand Jesus was God who came to earth as a man. He lived a sinless life. He went to that cross. When he went to the cross, God the Father saw him paying the penalty for sin. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He rose again and showed that the payment was accepted by God the Father. And today you must believe upon that series of facts. And when you say believe, it's not just mere agreement. It's a commitment. You must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He isn't someone you make Lord. He is Lord. That's what you're believing. Because look at the title. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a commitment. So please don't think that you can just nod your head, you know, oh, I agree, and then go out and live like the devil, because you can't. This is a repentance. You're turning from following, your, following yourself and following the path of sin. Now you're following the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means when you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the C of our ABC, the C to call upon his name. Whoever calls upon his name will not be disappointed. And 
whether you have to experience uh, physical death, you're secure because you'll know you're going to be resurrected. And if you're born again and Jesus Christ comes back in the next hour and you haven't died, then wow, you'll get this glorified body without ever dying. What an incredible reality that in a moment of watching this video, listening to my words, that you could be changed forever. I hope that's true.